my background is initially I worked as a, as a breeder for a, a private uh, sorghum company um, and then went back to uh, uni and did a, a PhD looking at um, using whole genome molecular markers uh, and was infected by the thinking of, of Cooper and Chapman and, and those guys around modelling. And uh, it's really had a big impact on the way, I guess, I think about breeding. And, and so what I'll try to do today is, is give you some of the, the, the flavour, and I think you've already got it from the previous speakers, of, of, of some of the opportunities, I think, that we have now to, to press forward in breeding. So I guess the other... Uh, thing that I think is is worth noting. It, it, there's a lot of technology out here. I think Duke man, mentioned it. There's a lot of money to get that technology into place. And so in a crop like sorghum in Australia, it's pretty small. So we've really needed to try and be sensible about the things that we tried to spend money on. Um, and also I work uh, quite a bit nowadays with the Gates Foundation working in, in Africa. And so often it's the simplest uh, technologies that actually have the biggest impl uh, impact, uh, at least at the start. So, nice paddock of sorghum there. So, I think one of the things that's useful is, is uh, this is a Stephen Covey thing, begin with the end in mind. And I think you could argue, and I think many people have, that, that plant improvement really hasn't changed a lot in 60 years. We still select the best ones, we cross them together, and put them out in the field and pick the best ones and, and go on. <coughs> um, but across a whole range of crops, the cost of each unit of progress is increasing. Uh, and yet we're in this period of unparalleled disruptive change where we see industries really completely changing. And you know, plant breeding is obviously right for this and you can see, the, uh, see it happening really at a meeting like this. So I guess it's sort of a, a question, but it's not really a question. Do we want to use technology to make our current processes more efficient or do we want to fundamentally change what we're doing? And I think it's really the latter. So you think about uh, oh, animation didn't work, never mind. A lot of breeding is, is either this, this black box approach, picking the best ones really, um, and it works. Uh, evolution works, plant breeding works, uh, but it's getting more costly and we have the potential now to do, do it better to actually aim for a, a more knowledge-driven uh, approach, uh, which has some opportunities for some big jumps, uh, but it doesn't have a great track record, breeding by design, I'd say. Um, and it requires resources, larger teams, and I'd have to say I don't see the money available for plant breeding increasing at the moment, so we need to work out efficient ways to do things. Uh, and although we talk about prediction and get excited about it, I think in many ways our capacity to predict uh, interactions is, is limited. So I'd say where are the big opportunities? I think they're in exploiting, working on the hard problems. So exploiting the full range of genetic diversity for quantitative traits. At the moment we skim the surface of, of the diversity that's out there. Uh, it's all very well to have high throughput phenotyping of a, of a breeding population, but that breeding population is only a very small proportion of the genetics that are out there. And there's no way you can put all of the genetics that's potentially available to you into a field that you can measure. So our, you know, that, that sort of machine learning approach is, is going to be challenged by that. How, how do you do that? How do you, how do you get all of the possible genotypes that are out there in the field? You can't really. So that's where I think the, the modelling is, is a really good, uh, I guess, power for, for that sort of technology. Uh, obviously interactions like G by E and G by E by M um, and, and non-additive variation are, are places where we could look to, to make some big progress. Uh, and what I'd call, I guess, higher order crop improvement, so not just breeding but crop improvement or system improvement. So what do I mean by that? So plant breeding is about developing superior varieties that have higher productivity or profitability in the context of an existing management. So what if we look at changing both management and genotype at the same time and look for the most optimal combination? Uh, again, we run into this problem of can we test all the permutations and combinations? And, and the answer is no, we, I can't run my breeding program in three different managements. Uh, that's just, just not possible. 
Um, but it's very exciting and, and a lot of the uh, productivity gains that have, that have happened in, in major crop species have come from that interaction. Uh, so it's, it's a place we know has, has impact, so how can we try and exploit them? And finally, there's farming systems improvement. So developing combinations of crops and varieties with, within crops and management systems that have higher productivity or profitability. So an individual crop might not be the highest yielding crop that you could grow, but we see this in Australia. If it leaves a little bit of extra water for the following crop, the net economic benefit to the farmer is greater. Or similarly, if you have a crop like sorghum that is a host for nematodes um, and uh, they build up and cause problems in the subsequent wheat, wheat crop, doesn't affect the sorghum. In fact, I've often thought this is a way I can increase the market share of sorghum is by breeding for nematode susceptibility to, to make it tougher. But no. So, so there are a whole system approach, system areas where again that, that idea of using crop modelling has, has potential to do things a bit better. So my context is working on sorghum. Um, I'm, I call myself a breeder, but I guess I'm a, a pre-breeder. I, I develop uh, germplasm that I, we license the, to commercial companies. So currently all the commercial hybrids in Australia have germplasm from our program, mostly at around 50%, and we license a lot of material overseas. So. Uh, we're pragmatic and we try and produce things that are going to be useful to the market. But at the same time, we like to do cool stuff and play with cool tools, toys. Uh, so, and, and I like to think of breeding for sorghum as, as extreme plant breeding. We've got this, this cropping zone. It's only about a million hectares, so it's not very big, which means there's not a lot of money. Um, it's dry land production and it's highly variable. Uh, we've got a planting window that goes from September to February. Um, and so, and a big range of area. So, so that has a r big impact. We're trying to produce varieties that will perform at greater than 10 tonnes per hectare and less than two tonnes per hectare, uh, which is very challenging. And that's one of the reasons that this interaction between genotype and management is, is so crucial to, to producing good varieties. So, in our system, we're trying to, and I think probably in any system, we're trying to identify favourable combinations of varieties and management practices uh, in this complex environment where the resources to search for those, those things are pretty limited. So how do, we, how do we address that? So we're driven by environment variation. So Karin showed you, showed you we, we're growing sorghum in the exact same environment that, that she's growing, or they're simulating wheat in. Um, and the type of environment experienced by the crop varies from location to location, season to season. And we really can't change that, unfortunately. We've got management systems, sort of agronomic research. Many different management systems are possible, particularly in sorghum. You can see that skip row sorghum there, where uh, what they do is space the plants out to allow the, the water in the inter-row to be available for the, for the crop uh, later in its growth. And it, it's, a, it's a good way of dealing with uh, soils of, of low water holding capacity. Um, so the value of a particular system depends on the, the genotypes that are grown in it. So there, there are all these context dependencies. So how do, we, how do we change them and select the best? So genotypes, as I said, there are a whole range of different genotypes that are possible, but the value of the particular genotype depends on the management system it's grown in and the pattern of environments that it experiences. So uh, while we can change them and select the best, our problem is one of identifying what is the best. And then we, we burrow down to the level of gene network. So that we know that genes don't act in isolation. We know that different combinations of genes can result in the same phenotype. And we know that interaction between those genes occurs at different scales. So it can occur at a you know, sort of a classical gene to gene level, or it can occur at a, at a trait level. So stay green and, and flowering time, or root architecture and flowering time. Uh, and the value of a particular gene really depends on the environment and management system that, that it's combined with. And again, we've got great powers to change these, but we, we don't really have a good target. So resource constraints really limit our capacity to, to investigate the large numbers of combinations. So the plant breeders evaluate large numbers of varieties using a limited number of management systems. The agronomists go out there and look at different types of management systems using a different uh, small variety, range of varieties. Um, 
and, and that's the range of varieties that they've got access to, which is limited by the, the breeders anyway. Uh, and the genomic researchers and trait biologists are only able to look at gene networks in, in limited numbers of genetic backgrounds. And they can only change small numbers of genes. And, and of, often uh, there are combinations that, that just don't ever occur. So there's this real disconnect. Um, changes in management systems may commit or compel, compel changes in varieties. So in sorghum, um, farmers in, in the dry areas moved to the skip row system uh, and it had some benefits. Um, all of the breeding programs operate in the, the solid planted system where you don't have, a, have uh, gaps between the rows. We know that the breeders are selecting uh, selecting suboptimal uh, varieties for this skip pro system. But the companies can't afford to put the money into running testing programs in those systems until later generations. So you've thrown away, likely, many of the useful genotypes by the time you get to that, that, that level. So there's a real disconnect there and an opportunity to do better. There's a disconnect between the development of genotypes and management systems. So changing a variety or changing varieties in a certain way can compel changes in management systems. So uh, we look at something like this. This is an insect pest of sorghum, uh, sorghum midge, which uh, had a real impact on, on when plant, the sorghum growers could plant their crops. So everyone had to plant at the same time, otherwise this midge built up and could cause 100% damage. Once resistance was put out there, suddenly a whole range of new planting times were available to those growers. And so there was a real uh, an opportunity to do different things with management that wasn't there before, um, and and op explore opportunities that people hadn't thought of before. And there's a disconnect between detailed trait biology and genetics research and performance in real world systems. So changes in particular traits can have positive or negative impacts on yield depending on the context. And so this is some of the, the root angle work that we're doing. Uh, because root angle turns out to be really important in sorghum as well, not surprisingly, uh, when you're dealing with, with water capture. So, so there's a big constraint. And the context dependencies, well, these interactions turn out to be pretty important. Here's a really good example. Uh, this is uh, yield improvement in maize, and the dots rec represent hybrids released uh, in particular years. This is work from, from Duvik et al., it's pioneer stuff. And the round dots versus the triangles represent two different management environments. So management of, say, 1930s and management of, of the present day. So just by changing uh, the agronomy or the management, you can get a small increase in yield. So uh, the geneticists would say, yay, we've done all the work, hard, heavy lifting. However, if you look at the improvement due to genetics, it's, it's not that good either. So really, a lot of that massive improvement in, in maize yields has, has been new due to tuning genetics and management together. And in a place like the US, you've got very large areas where you can do that sort of tuning. In a place like Australia, we have these very variable environments, so our capacity to do that tuning is hampered by our inability to see what's going on. So, when Lee asked me to, to do this talk, he said, oh, I'll just talk about integrating new technologies, yeah, you know, <laughs> to, to choose some topics. So uh, what I've done is, is basically talk, you know, talk about um, breeding program informatics, which I think is probably one of the important things, which is pretty uh, sadly neglected, really, in, in a lot of breeding programs. Uh, and, and then I'm going to talk about um, potential applications of crop simulation modelling and, and our use of it so far, though perhaps not as elegantly as Corinne. Um, and, and also the way I've had the advantage in, in the work that I've done of having money that has been free to try and, and use uh, or implement in research, in a research focus. But really in a lot of breeding programs, you're going to have to give up one thing to take on another, or you have to generate savings. So the amount of money is important. The skills that are available, uh, we've just bought ourselves a little fleet of drones and uh, started to build a, a, um, um, a system to, to 
uh, a ground rig to measure all this sort of stuff and, and suddenly you realise, well, we need people to do image analysis, we need people to, and it's expensive and it's slow and then they want a better computer and then it gets to be very expensive and, and a lot of seed companies in the market sizes that we deal with are just not going to be able to afford that. So, um, you know, trying to find the right technology that fits, fits uh, the users, I guess. Uh, the current scale of your breeding program, as I said, and what other technologies are in place? So, NIR, great thing for a hospital. It improved outcomes. People could do some great stuff. Take an NIR machine and stick it into a, a medical clinic in the third world and it would burn resources. It would be, have a, uh, reduce the outcomes. And, and that's what you see in many plant breeding programs. People trying to take on a technology the, the rest of their, uh, their system isn't designed for. So you really have to have the infrastructure of other technology around you to really get into some of these, these deeper tech, tech areas. So when I was a, a bit younger, I played this, this game called Civilization, um, which, which was really cool in that you, know, you had to develop your civilization, develop technologies and one technology led to the next technology and if you didn't have uh, pottery you couldn't develop seafaring or whatever it was. But really the same thing is true of a plant breeding program. So I'd say a clear one, if you don't have a good inventory system for seed and a, and a system for tracing seed sources, then you should re really not be looking at getting into molecular markers. And so many breeding programs have very poor systems for that and are spending many, many thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars on molecular markers. So, and again, because of our experience in Africa, working with, with developing country programs, um, I'm gonna talk about this breeding program informatics, but, but you'd also, I'd have to say, because the, the, we've done quite a lot of work with uh, breeding programs in Australia and, and outside of Australia, uh, where you would think that systems would be much better, but the reality is many plant breeding programs are operating at a pretty low level. Okay, so what, is, what does it mean? My definition of it is something, the, the basic building block of a breeding program, so something that handles inventory management, data collection, data storage, retrieval, genealogy, seed sources, DNA barcoding, uh, oh, I've got the inventory management twice, IP management, it's also important, uh, error minimization. So all the sort of kind of boring stuff, but the really critical in a plant breeding program. And if you don't get it right, uh, you waste a lot of money. So we, we've spent quite a lot of our time and, and resources on, on software development for plant breeding for our own purposes. And I'm not trying to sell our stuff because it's, it's really designed for our purpose. Quite a lot of people use it, but it's not uh, uh, you know, particularly user friendly. But uh, it's, it's in use well, uh, in a range of crops and um, it's the result of uh, practical implementation, I guess. So some of the things are quite useful. So there's a plant breeding database, Kathmandu, pedigree database, which is now in Kathmandu. There's a di digital field book with a centralised syn synchronisation about it. Um, whole lot of uh, barcoded based inventory systems. Um, and a glasshouse crossing tool thing, and, and a range of other things. And they're just critical, the things that you have to have. Nice pictures. Uh, and really, this sort of thing is, is, you know, the bigger seed companies have it, the smaller seed companies are using things like Agribase, which probably don't cut it in today's world. Hopefully there are no died in the wool Agribase people here. Um, it's not just about programming, you've got to have the right hardware, so pack of printers, barcoders, tablets, phones, storage systems, maybe you're using RFID, servers, wireless, whatever it is. Uh, and it's not just hardware, it's protocols. You've got to have systems in place and often plant breeding systems were developed before the current breeder was born or the breeder before him was born and some of them are really not that uh, transferable to the digital world Naming systems, particularly, we, we converted a lot of naming systems and pedigree uh, systems. Uh, and it, it's a bit like your, your rust scoring. It's a typical example of a, 
of a coding system that struggles with, <laughs> with the digital age. Uh, and we, we use one of the nine star scale, so <laughs> I can say that. Okay, so, so it's, not, it's not a simple thing. And when people say, oh, right, here's BMS, you're going to go and you're going to use it, it's, there's a whole lot of cultural change that goes on. And anyone who's been involved in change management will tell you that's not easy. So I'd just like to sh share with you what's, what we've been able to do within our program in, in 14 years or so. Um, the program has a budget of around $500,000 a year to, to grow trials, and it's increased to $750,000 by 2014, but that's, that's basically inflation. Um, in that time, we've been able to scale our, our program from 350 hybrids at four to five locations, doing three to four traits, um, to something around seven to 10 locations with NIR, some imaging, some environment characterization. Um, basically, Increase the number of nursery rows by 10 times, increase the number of genotypes evaluated by 10 times, increase the number of phenotypes by 16 times, and really that's going to increase greatly in the next couple of years as, as these new technologies come on stream. Uh, digital field scorer, sort of a, a basic tool of a plant breeder, but I suspect in the, in the near future less and less so, which will be great. It means less hours out in the sun. Um, but that's a nice little tool, and, and, and if program doesn't have something like that, it needs it. Uh, massive time savings in data entry, greater reduced error rate, enhanced data sharing, reduced analysis time, and uh, we can do some novel data collection methods, very simple but effective. Uh, we used to measure plant height in sorghum using a stick with numbers on it. Uh, and conventionally it would take two people uh, a couple of days to do that. Um, now with the electronic field book and, uh, and a barcode reader, same thing could be done by a single person in a three quarters of a day. Now with the drone and um, 3D rendering of the, of, of the field, well maybe we can do that in you know, half an hour of a person's time and, and a fair bit of computing time. Uh, this is a, a, again a simple one, the barcode and seed DNA infantry systems. So again, has a really big impact. Traceability is very important if you're going to do anything with markers. Uh, cool plant breeding databases are critical as well. Um, and again, it's amazing how poor these are in many programs dealing with uh, aliases. So you've got the same genotype with different names, or worse still, uh, different genotypes with the same name. Um, Really, you need to have that stuff. Uh, storing pedigree data can allow you to do pedigree blobs, and again, it's amazing how many plant breeding programs are not doing that. Okay, so there's a lot of data. It creates a whole lot of IT infrastructure problems that you have to deal with, uh, and I don't think I necessarily have a solution, but it's a problem that lots of other people have. So hopefully they'll solve the problem for me, particularly the image analysis people. <laughs> okay, so, to move to something, I guess, a, a little bit more complicated, a little bit more of the uh, cream on the cake sort of thing, which is the use of uh, models in, in plant breeding programs. Uh, so Graham Hammer uh, did a lot of his early modelling work, or still does a lot of our modelling work in sorghum, because sorghum turns out to be a nice crop to model. It's uh, It's got tillers, but not too many tillers. It's got leaves, but not too many leaves. It's uh, it's a bit like if, if you've played with Lego and you've played with Duplo, it's the Duplo of, of plants for, for, for crop, crop modelers. So you can chop a plant up and you can put it through a leaf area meter and it's, it's not going to cause that person to go mad, which I think may be the case in wheat. I don't know. Are we going to be mad wheat physiologists? I don't know. But it, it's meant that the progress in, in uh, modeling in sorghum is, is, is well ahead of many of the other crops. So we've heard a lot of reasons why you want to use models. Um, but I think one of the, the exciting things for me is if a model provides a reasonable representation of reality, then it can be used to explore complex systems in an in inexpensive way. Now, as long as it's reasonable, it can just allow you to identify some interesting best bet uh, 
um, combinations of genetics and management, perhaps, that you go out and test in the field. And, and as Duke said, the exciting part is the potential to integrate knowledge in a dynamic way. Um, and also the, the capacity to, to predict untested scenarios. So we started to try and do this in the, in the uh, I guess, 2003, four. started to get into this, and, and based on some stuff that um, uh, I guess Scott Chapman had done on, on environment characterisation. So you'll get to hear the environment characterisation story again, but with a sorghum uh, flavour. But here's a nice little... This is a, a slide that I put together when I was really excited about simulation modelling and how, how good it was going to be. So we think about how we've developed things. So developing aircraft, um, we've tended to use this prototyping system where that aircraft maybe moved to something that looked like that, that moved to something that looked like that, that moved to something that looked like that. Now that, that could all be done just by tweaking things, changing things empirically. When you try and move from that aircraft to that aircraft, you've got an aircraft that is not a... It's a step change. You couldn't do that by a tweaking. That thing is inherently unstable. It can't fly without a computer to fly it. And so you need computer modelling to go that sort of a jump. And that's what I think... where I think there, are, there is some potential to do something a bit exciting in plant breeding is to, to take those jumps. OK. Looks very like, uh, like a talk, talk that we had just previously. Uh, ecotyping, or EC, EC as, as we would call it, uh, enhancing selection decisions through understanding the target population environments. G by E by M optimization, I think this is probably one where we would, in, in Sorghum, be a bit more excited about changing populations, changing tillering, flowering time to planting time to, to get the most out of the water that we have available to us. Um, and enhanced selection by, by a trait uh, dissection and, and, that, and obviously the, the trait value piece also fits in there. So all the things that, that Corinne said, uh, water stress is a key constraint for sorghum as well as wheat. I want to know when it occurs, I want to know where it occurs. I want to know the impact of traits. I want to know the impact of management. I want to know the impact of the interaction between, trait, between genotype and management. So a um, number of years ago, Scott Chapman did EC for sorghum. We uh, took that a step further by bringing in uh, some genetic components. So we took the flowering time range that we saw in sorghum and the, the um, tillering range that we saw in sorghum. Uh, and the management that was used in, in sorghum, and, and we generated the EC based on that um, that combination of virtual genotypes, virtual management systems, using 100 years of climatic data. And we came up with five uh, environment types, and, and obviously we, were, we identified uh, stress um, uh, frequencies or the frequencies of these particular environment types uh, in particular regions. So this is, so the stress index is, is the amount of uh, water that a crop uh, would like relative to the amount of water that's available to it. So the stress index one is, is a low stress environment, two is uh, sort of terminal stress, three is terminal stress relieved, little triangles represent um, flowering time, four is a really bad terminal stress, and five is a um, you know, it's a pretty severe terminal stress. Interestingly, we e uh, ecotype all of our trials now and we almost never see a, an environment type 4. And I think the reason for that is we have got our planting rules wrong. So farmers do not plant in environment. Uh, that's a really high risk strategy. You're relying on a lot of in-crop rain. And so what we found is that the farmers where we plant our actual trials don't uh, go in, or we don't aren't willing to plant trials in, in those environment type fours. So that's a pretty pretty neat thing. It helps you understand the environment and its variability. You, you can use it to to plan the uh, location of field trials. Uh, you could use it to to generate managed environments. Although I've never really had the money to do that well. Um, and we can use it to evaluate traits. Um, 
and management systems to, to see about you know, what are combinations that might be useful. So I was, what I was going to do is, is go through some of the traits that we've, we've looked at in, in sorghum over a period of time. Um, the first one was osmotic adjust, adjustment. In the early 90s, this was the, the, you know, the fad trait for the physiologists in sorghum. Uh, it really was one that the breeders didn't really, weren't very impressed with because most of the things that had high osmotic adjustment were uh, pretty crap. Um, using a technical term. So, we, yeah, there was a little bit of doubt there, but there was a lot of investment uh, in the empirical research and eventually it came to the dis decision that in most of our environments, um, osmotic adjustment uh, wasn't going to be very useful. Subsequently, when we had access to modelling and we, we could do a reasonable job at modelling uh, osmotic adjustment, uh, the model basically told us the same story that really you wouldn't put a lot of effort into osmotic adjustment in sorghum in Australia. Other environments, it could be useful, but not, not in Australia. Okay, second trait is root, root architecture. So the modelling work, and, and here we started with a model uh, indicating that capturing a bit of extra water at depth would be very favourable in many of our environments, particularly in this solid planting arrangement. And uh, we did some empirical work looking at this root angle and we found that it did in fact allow the sorghum plant to extract more water at depth. This is for J.R. Singh's work. Um, we also were able to uh, take those regions of the genome that were associated with root angle and um, trace those alleles into our breeding population so we could look at what what was the impact in a real live breeding program. We found that region, those regions of the genome were Firstly, associated with increased yield in most sites, but they were also in, associated with our stay green trait. So, really suggested that it was a useful thing. Modelling also suggests that the wide root angle could be useful in this this skip row uh, uh, system that people use on on shallow soils. Uh, we're yet to test this, uh, but it will be a very interesting thing because it gives uh, the plant breeders a way of, I guess, tuning their genotypes to a particular management system. Okay, so the last trait is uh, limited maximum transpiration rate, and there's certainly some interest in this in a, in a range of crops. Modelling suggests that this is a very valuable trait in most Australian soil environments, almost too good to be true. Uh, the initial research that we've done indicates that we've already been selecting for it in the breeding program, which makes us more confident that it is a real thing and a useful thing. Uh, and it's co we're confident enough to, to start investing in some high throughput uh, screening systems to, to actually measure that so we can map it and potentially either select for it with markers or select for it directly. So I guess we went from the phase of saying, look, we had to do empirical experimentation and convince ourselves that something worked through to uh, using modelling a, a little bit more through to being reasonably confident that modelling is pointing us in a direction where we should at least be willing to uh, risk some resources. Okay, so the next step, so we talked about doing EC more generally, but to do EC at every breeding trial, uh, that's what, what we try and do in my program at the moment. Um, you need to have some key genotypes that are characterised so that you can run them within the model. You need to understand the soil, uh, plant available water, nitrogen, etc. You need to have an idea of soil water at, at sowing and maturity. Um, you need climatic data, which is relatively easy to get. You need to get a quadrat harvest at flowering maturity, which are less fun, uh, doing leaf areas, going out. You know, for us, it might be a four, four hour drive to go out there, harvest the plot, bring it back. It's very hard to convince the technicians that it's a sensible thing. But um, then you've got to run the model, match it to the embryo type. That's not too bad, but you need to have people who can do that. And then you have to start thinking about how, how best to use it. And I guess the point that I would make is that it's not a trivial amount of work to do this. Dave, what's quadrat harvest? Quadrat is, is taking a biomass sample. A, a biomass sample. Oh. Yeah, and, and you know, doing leaf area, doing biomass, doing grain. Uh, so, yeah, there's a bit of work, but mainly it's the travel, really. Uh, 
So uh, obviously some sort of uh, remote sensing system that allowed you to measure the plant in situ would be a, a really useful thing here. But the, there are technical challenges. So soils are the really tricky part. Uh, a, a, a trial may look very e or a piece of ground where you want to grow a trial might look very even, but uh, underneath things can be quite different. Now what you see here is a this is an extremely high stress uh, year, and that's a sorghum crop with heads coming out here and plants too stressed to produce heads on either side. And that's just due to a little bit of difference in either the water holding capacity or the way the water's run through that field. And that, that's going to happen in your trials, um, and so it's a, um, it's a real challenge. So what we tended to do is, at the start, we used to go out and, and dig holes and measure the soil on each of our uh, genotypes and then try to model things. Now what we do is uh, use the biomass to fix the model to the environment. So we don't try and model the environment per se, but we say here is a crop, it's grown like this, we knew what the starting conditions were sort of, we knew when it flowered, we fitted, tuned the model to fit that, that system and then we start doing genetic tweaks. Okay, so uh, uh, Corinne talked about um, increasing uh, response to selection by uh, weighting environments and, and you know, there's some good uh, papers by Cooper and Podleg to suggest that this would really have a, a useful effect and particularly in our case where we have a small number of trials. Although um, because of the amount of work involved in, in running um, EC in our program, um, I'm not sure that it would be cost effective on its own if that was all we were getting from it. And we could probably do it in other ways, potentially with uh, probe genotypes or something like that. But we can start to really burrow into the, the um, nature of genotype performance and I think this is where it starts to get exciting for me. Um, <coughs> here for example is the stress index for uh, a particular trial, Kilcummon, where we we saw what we would call the perfect um, post-flowering drought stress uh, and we know that this trait stay green is associated with yield in sorghum under post-flowering drought stress and uh, nine being plant going dead, one being green and, and we saw that that was indeed true. In this particular environment uh, there was a very large, that's the real data on the left there, a uh, real large effect of, of stay green as we might predict it gave us some confidence in, in, the, in that data. So as Corinne also showed, all the genotypes in a trial don't flower on the same day and we've got very, very good accurate measures of flowering time so we can start to look at what was the stress index that individual genotypes uh, experienced in that trial and you can see you can get quite different stress patterns depending on flowering time. So this very early genotype basically escapes the stress. Um, so that's interesting and, and plant breeders knew this but the problem is you can't go to a plant, go to a particular trial and say well this is the cause of this genotype being <coughs> high yielding or low yielding, particularly in a, except in a case like this where you've got a very clear stress type that you might be able to say that. So similar to, to Corinne's thing and, and when we first did modelling uh, about 2004 or whatever it was, modelling our breeding trials, this was the thing that excited me the most. Uh, when we tried to use uh, environment types to remove GBIE, it had an effect, sure, but not as much as we would have liked. And then uh, we looked at this range of different, uh, I guess, virtual genotypes. So up the top there you can hardly see it, but it's different maturities in the big block boxes. Is that going to work? No. And then underneath are, are different levels of till tillering. So effectively what you're, you're doing is changing the leaf area of the plant and its duration so that uh, an early maturing hybrid with low tillering uh, uses much less water than a late maturing hybrid with, with high tillering. And the environment types have, have been colour coded and each one of these lines represents a um, 
a virtual trial run at a particular location and in a particular year. So it's 100 years of climatic data. And you can see that in almost every year, you have a mixture of environment uh, types. Um, and this is what our, our check genotype is, sits there, those two white lines. So if we use the environment type of the check genotype, uh, it gives you an idea of what the environment is like, but it's not necessarily uh, the be all and end all. Okay, so to look at similar sort of data in a, in a different way, here we have flowering time, again, and tillering. And this is yield measured at uh, a particular site, this Bill Wheeler site in 2006. And what we can see there is that um, if you're an early maturing variety, then having a higher level of tillers will actually increase your yield. If you're a late maturing variety, more tillers will de decrease your yield. So uh, is tillering good or bad? Well, it depends. Uh, and, and this is the problem that, that plant breeders face, whether they know it or not particularly as you start to get to these physiological traits, they're, they're good or they're bad. It really depends. Okay, so that's a picture of tillers. Uh, and that's some, uh, that's not correct, actually. Maybe. Sorry, that's a real data s beside it for that trial, looking at just flowering time. <coughs> and you can see that flowering time explains quite a lot of the variation yield, or reasonable amount of variation yield. But really, we know that this tillering thing's going on. We know the root angle thing's going on. So how much of the difference in genotype performance there is explained by these relatively simple traits that we know well? Quite a lot, I'd say. OK. Same set of virtual genotypes grown in a high-yielding, favourable environment. Um, and again, changing the environment changes the trait value. So tillering is universally good. Um, Later flowering is universally good. Um, but to have that information at your disposal helps you to, to, to start thinking about how you, how you should do selection. And the, I think the, the, the paper that um, Graham mentioned, this techno paper, shows you one of the ways that you could start to approach that problem within a, a um, genomic selection context. So there's a lot of simple stuff, well, simple in that we know how it works. We know how flowering time and tillering influence water use. So by removing that effect of flowering time and tillering, we could start to make, put a lot more selection pressure on the genes that affect the other things that we might want to push around a bit more. Whereas back here, we're going to probably ignore all those ones because they're bad. Yet some of those genotypes might actually be quite superior. They've just had a, a very uh, poor combination of, of, of the other traits. Dave, does your uh, environment type vary uh, from year to year in the same location? Or is it consistent in the same location? That's environment. Each, that is a year. These are the environment types for different, different genotypes. OK. So even within a year, the environment type changes. For different genotypes. For different genotypes and between years. So these are between years. So that genotype is going to have that. So that's a genotype running up and down the... And that's all one location? That's all one location. Wow. Extreme plant breeding. <laughs> OK. Except it's not that extreme, because there's an awful lot of the world that has to deal with that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, so I was saying you can... Ex ex Increase the selection intensity for the other things by adjusting for water use. Uh, and then potentially reconstruct the most optimal combination of flowering time and tillering and management because you understand them. So, just started to, to get into using drone based um, imaging to measure things that will be useful to us. And in, in our case, it's easy, relatively easy to count heads uh, from the drone which gives us a very good measure of tillering, which you can see is one of those important things in that model. The root architecture piece is another important one, and, and we've got a high throughput system for that. So we've probably got flowering, uh, tillering, and root angle. So we can start to look at either using the model or using deviations from the model, so using uh, 
the genotype's performance relative to its, uh, its virtual self, and that deviation is, is its, its uh, potential good, or whether it has some potentially favourable or unfavourable genes. <coughs> okay, and that works really well for counting heads, which is also something the technicians were very pleased to see. <coughs> so I guess this is a, a picture that I put together when GS first started to get to be an interesting thing and we thought yes that would be good but we have this issue where um, a lot of the traits that we're interested in have an optimal value um, and particularly flowering time, tillering leaf <coughs> area height where um, we're trying to optimise uh, water use. And breeding populations in Australia tend to sit on the conservative size of optimal for obvious reasons. Um, but if one was to use a very naive uh, geno genomic selection protocol and do um, uh, selection without phenotyping for a number of generations, uh, it's very easy to pick up a signal associated with something that you don't want and overshoot, potentially overshoot the value and end up with a lot of unadapted material. So. Again, I think that that idea that in the techno paper of making use of the model to to uh, avoid that problem is is uh, interesting. Uh, so Scott's not in the audience, but uh, again, this is a, a slide out of the, the work that we did together on um, modelling in our breeding trials. So this is a particular breeding trial, and each of the boxes that's flowering time, that's tillering. Um, <coughs> the light yellow colour represents uh, the highest yielding uh, individuals. Um, and so here's root angle and here's maximum transpiration rate. So it's a complex graph looking at, at the interaction between those four traits. And you can see, well, in this particular year, in 2004, um, you know, the, be the best genus type, oh, sorry, the dark red is the high yielder, I think. Got it the wrong way around. Best yielding is, is in the top corner. Now, if we look at a time series of 10 years for that exact same site, that exact same soil, that exact same set of virtual genotypes, ooh, yeah, they look pretty, e each one of those is sort of a surface, so with the dark red being the highest. Okay, so here we've got the time series from 2001 to 2010. And if you look at the top, uh, corner, you can see uh, sometimes it's the best, sometimes it's the worst. Um, and I think having access to this sort of information about your genotypes offers a whole range of different ways to, um, I guess, make better selection decisions. <coughs> okay, so uh, yeah, clearly this is a collaboration between a lot of people, so Graham Hammer large input, um, Andrew Borrell in the stay green work, Eric Van Oostrom with TE and root angle, Greg McLean is a modeler, Vijay Singh with the root stuff, uh, Emma Mace on, on markers and QTL work, Colleen Hunt's a biometrician, Alan Crookshank's a, a breeder with me, Bob Hensel was my predecessor who gave me a chance to do some of these crazy things, uh, Michael Hassel and David Rogers are programmers involved in the uh, information technology and, and Scott Chapman who's a uh, person who's involved in many things. Uh, we've had funding from a range of people, the Queensland Government, University of Queensland, RC, which is Australian Research Council. GRDC have been a big funder of the program over many years and in recent years, so the, the work on the TE and roots and um, the breeding program improvement in, in Ethiopia is funded by the Gates Foundation. So, you can ask me questions or you could ask Corinne or <laughs> others. <laughs>